a very small IT update kind of took down the world. The data science, there are platforms like Kaggle. The programmers say this hacker rank. The cyber security try hack me, hack the box. What about cloud? Same networking concept. A VPC is a global in GCP and a VPC is regional in AWS. I learned uh, practically using these GitHub Labs. And security is a smaller landscape compared to other technology. Whenever you build something, Try to build it in a secure way. Oh, the vulnerabilities type. Before building a secure application. Quantum what? computing. Uh, rather than conventional computing, it focuses on quantum mechanics. Most applications are deployed in Kubernetes. Quantum proof encryption methodology. They, our current encryption method can be broken. Uh -huh. Zero day vulnerabilities are rare. Uh -huh. It doesn't happen often. Hello everyone, welcome to Learn Launch with Ravi Tijamura Brana, episode 1. In this episode, I'm excited to have a conversation with Mikesh, who has over 13 years of experience in security. He's currently working as a senior security engineer at Google. So without any delay, let's welcome Mikesh. Welcome to the podcast, Mikesh. It's great having you on our podcast. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much. And it's great to be here in the podcast. Thanks for accepting my invitation, Mikesh. So before going into uh, like podcast, can you share a bit about uh, your journey? How did you become a uh, Google Cloud uh, security engineer? What inspired you? Yes, I'm from Nepal. Uh, I worked throughout. I got a scholarship eventually in India. Got a chance to work there. And once I got an opportunity to work there, I got to start with Wipro. I started with a network security engineer. Eventually, Initially, I would say like uh, there were there had been some inhibitions upon me saying that I would not be able to crack a bigger organizations and those organizations are only meant for the peoples from better schools or better education. I think those were just uh, the limitations on my side. And once I understood that, okay, things can change if you study well, if you prepare well, and if you believe in your skills, eventually you get a chance. And I think I think uh, the first time when I started working on Qualys, which was a product security company. And then from there to Amazon and to Google. And I think this has been a fantastic journey. Thanks for sharing that. So how is the interview process in Google for uh, cloud security professionals? Okay. I, I think yeah, you, you should have already read about a lot in a different kind of videos. All I would say is that it's simple. Believe in your skills. Anybody can crack it. It's not way too tough as described. Believe in your skills. I think uh, a few common skills which people look out is one, how do you communicate, right? How do you communicate not only with people, but also with your computer? Programming, automation, tool, how do you communicate with people? That should be comfortable enough. Other than that, I would say have a good attitude. Like you should always have an attitude to solve a problem. And a slightly different one, I'll say like a critical analytical ability, thinking ability, thinking from top-down view sometime. Like you should have that wider picture to understand a problem, its impact, and based on that, take an action. Sometimes we are too engaged to solve a small problem. We do not see the impact and risk associated with it. We do not see the see a bigger, bigger picture. And I think if all these three are there, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but you are bound to grow either in Google or somewhere, but eventually. So how many levels uh, will there be for, you know, usually to crack the Google? I think uh, everything is standardized now. Uh, you will see four interviews across. Uh -huh. Mostly you will see two focused on your role. Uh -huh. One, it could be more around, uh, it could be coding, it could be system design, uh -huh. it could be automation, it could be troubleshooting. Based upon your roles, it could be design. And the last one, again, coming back, it would, it is called Googliness, but again, uh -huh. about uh, around your critical analytical ability and your attitude. When I went to Google Extended I.O. Uh, in Bangalore, there I see a board inside the uh, Google office that 40% uh, are uh, because of this reference. So do you think mm -hmm. reference play an important role, uh, uh, you know, getting into MNCs? Definitely. The reason behind this is, I think, pretty simple. It is difficult to hire an individual. It takes a longer process. And uh, to if somebody already can vet your skill, already who have worked with you and can vet your skill, it's easier that way for recruiter, for hiring manager, they would have that initial trust and understanding saying that Googler always bet for your skills. So that's an easy way approach. And I think this should be throughout the industry, not only in Google. Yeah, true, true, I agree that. And uh, what cloud certifications do you recommend for people you know, who want to enter into cloud domain? For certification, I have a very yeah. different view. I think uh, take certification is, is a way to learn. Sometime when we are learning new skills, we tend to either go deep or go wide. We do not have a 
proper focus and sometimes certification give us that focus saying okay this is what you need to study this is how you need to study there is a step by step approach to it and these days there are some hands on certifications even scenario based certifications so all of these will eventually help you and if if you would have to pick something always pick something which is on your role if you are doing security where do you stand in your security journey right like if you are starting out maybe security plus that could be a starting point if you have few years of experience and you have worked in multiple technologies maybe neutral ones like cisp pccsp can work but if you are already into one core technology let's say if you are working on google cloud then google cloud security engineer certification it's up to you but uh, mm-hmm. take this as not something which gives you a job or not for something to showcase your skill more from kind of a course book to help you guide and learn is there any path for example uh, you know directly giving uh, a top a gcp certification it may take some time right so is there any steps through which i can take maybe a uh, starting for example if you consider aws like usually people prefer the practitioner and then go with the solutions architect so is there True. any uh, similar kind of uh, certification path that you would recommend yeah definitely so for me i always think it in a two way one uh, you should always think as an engineer so always go with a normal especially if you are looking into google cloud right google cloud is more focused from engineering point of view mm-hmm. and i would definitely say that uh, pick up uh, an engineering associate certification and then maybe a solution architect associate certification and then move to the professional one these two will give you kind of a baseline engineering slightly hands on slightly automations understanding how to interact with the sdks consoles clis and solution architect associates are usually for understanding a broader scope of different services and mm-hmm. how those could be utilized to build a solution and eventually pick your specialized as you mentioned there will be a few certifications which only uh, concentrate on theory there are some certifications which also concentrate on labs a practical but you know like where can we learn this because for example if you consider data science there are few platforms like kaggle and for programmers it is like hacker rank for cyber security people use try hack me hack the box what about cloud is there any platform through which they can learn from beginning i would say quick labs quick labs is a a good one quick mm-hmm. labs give you an opportunity to run, uh, to do your own labs so whenever you have any let's say you are trying to build a web solution in any cloud mm-hmm. it gives you an exercise step by step guide okay. but yeah definitely once you do it right you have to understand what it teaches about sometimes we just tend to copy paste and we yeah. don't go dive deep so definitely a quick lab is a perfect one and i would also say that a lot of these vendors like cloud providers what they do is they provide a lot of free education free training free certifications a lot of these labs a lot of these are in github so if i would definitely say like github as an learning experience is a perfect one because you will find a lot of solutions that are already built just try and replicate those there are terraform modules built already just copy those deploy it in your environment see how it reacts that's the approach to learn yeah true even uh, i did start in the same way uh, because i had a training in my company where they have uh, trained me uh, in azure is it 500 is it 700 so before giving the certifications i used to do the labs so like it, it was in a github so every step i used to do the labs and i used to record it and I used to post in the you know youtube so that's how i learned uh, practically using these github labs and after that i gave uh, exam and it was done so Perfect. i think people can uh, use these github labs and you know they can uh, instead of you know blindly going into step by step know what what each tool does what is its importance and so on uh, through sure. which you can learn that so i agree important. yeah and uh, also for example as i said like if people who know azure uh, can they learn gcp and aws as well so coming from amazon and to gcp i i understand this journey so mm-hmm. i would not say it is like to like but of course at the end everything is basic in a security let's say ssl handshake you know it will be similar across throughout be it one cloud or other cloud but when you start using it you'll see a lot of differences you'll see how somebody envision a same product in a very different style same networking concept a vpc is a global in gcp and a vpc is regional in aws and it seems like a very small uh difference but mm-hmm. once you start implementing solution you'll say like okay there are a lot of things which you need to change and i, I would say don't get uh, hindered by this the basic remains same but of course there would be a learning yeah because so, uh, even i did like whenever uh, i used aws and azure i did found there are few differences so which you will learn gradually when you 
uh, do a few tasks. Uh, you have witnessed 13 years of uh, security evolution, right? So what are the most uh, significant changes that you have observed and how has the threat landscape transformed? I think uh, we are seeing a lot of changes in recent times. I think cloud is definitely one of them, but I think it is kind of stabilized now and everybody understand it. But if you see, right, like the cloud gave you a capability of uh, automation and that automation give you a capability i recall the time when when if we had to move one router from one location to another location it could have taken you like a year or a year and a half time or mm-hmm. just a move a lease line from one place to another it takes a longer period of time a lot of risk and impact assessment no clear discovery of your assets no clear understanding of networking but now if you look into if you want to really learn the active directory you should be able to just spin it up play around and you can easily get to know a lot of these concepts easily. So what cloud did was give you a capability to learn any kind of a skill, implement anything at your will in a very short period of a time. And that automation has changed like life of every, I would say engineers who are working in cloud or any technology, life has become much easier. And then we are also witnessing a lot of change with AI, of course, and then I guess last two years. And that could be one of the bigger technology boom, which we have seen since the invent of uh, even internet. This should be one of the crazy years where people would recall saying, okay, this is 2023 when we saw AI and it completely changed our life. And we'll talk, I think uh, we can talk more about uh, how AI influenced it, but I would say that uh, these two definitely strike me really hard. Also, and this also help adversaries too. It's not like that it only has the oh. engineers. So adversaries learned a lot. The threats have uh, have gone slightly more sophisticated now. There have been frameworks around a lot of attacks. It's much easier for them to craft a solution. And then we also see a lot of, uh, rather than individual adversaries, we can see statewide and nationwide adversaries. So definitely there had been a lot of change. I would definitely term automation and AI are the key. Yeah, uh, true. And like, like, what are the top three threats of for cloud according to you? If I see simply by numbers, I'll say like misconfiguration still count as top, I think. Despite this, uh, different report being published by different vendors, all I see is misconfigurations. Uh-huh. It's very simple. And I think the second one, if I think uh, it's mostly around identities, which is around creating keys, overprivileged uh, machine identities, you'll see all those arounds. I think these two would be most prevalent ones. Uh-huh. Other than, other than, I would assume that recently we have seen a lot of serverless being used as a means of attack. Because it's easy to spin up, you can hide behind CSP's IP address, less configuration and maintenance for the people. So I think people are also also leveraging serverless as a attack vector. Uh, like even like you know whenever uh, there is like a vulnerable this misconfiguration threats, there are a lot of alerts. So how do you think we can prioritize these alerts? I think I think there is a term called alert fatigue because of this because you see a lot of alerts everywhere and we have a lot of things right now. All of them are atomic. If you see machine having a vulnerability is very atomic finding. It doesn't give you anything. Now at the context saying whether that machine is public or private, that is one context to it. Mm And more context saying whether it is reachable from internet or not, the network connectivity, it gives you a more context. And let's say that that particular machine has an identity attached to it and that identity can read or write to very specific PII data storage could be buckets, could be database. Now this becomes critical and this is automatically prioritized. And I think recently a lot has been improved and a lot of tools have managed to give us that context. Mm -hmm. So alert prioritization, which usually used to depend just on severity, has moved to, I'll say, a combination of findings. I will also say that there is a kind of a virtual red teaming exercise, which uh, as a part of a product solution, you will see which will, which will eventually try to see that what vulnerabilities can be exploited to reach to your high value resources. And that gives you another score. I think this score along with severity, along with the context should be a perfect way to prioritize your vulnerability. Uh, got it. You said that like you have to connect the dots, right? Sure. So are there any specific tools through which we can do it uh, in cloud? Okay. So I think uh, there is a quite a buzzword uh, Despite AI being a top trend, I think uh, CNAV is another buzzword which has been around uh, for like last 
one, one and a half year. And mm-hmm. Gartner introduced this term, I guess, just two years back. Mm-hmm. But if you look into this product, right, uh, especially for cloud, it tries to merge a lot of these atomic solutions like CSPM, DSPM, CWPP, CIEM, all of these mm-hmm. into a single umbrella. And mm-hmm. what it does is what I, I have been talking about. Give you a context from everywhere. DSPM gives you data sensitivity, data risk. Kim or CIEM would give you information about identity. How does identity proliferate? Similarly, CSPM gives you a misconfiguration. Vulnerability will give you the vulnerability data. And all of these are merged together and then eventually given you with a score which you can use to prioritize rather than the severity. And and I would say this is an interesting phase uh, because uh, these are just a few things which I shared about. You'll also see a lot like uh, when you talk about vulnerability, whether there has been a fix available, whether it can be exploited, exploited by which kind of a vendor, how complex is is the exploit, so there are a lot of things which is factored in. If we would have to have factored that individually, it would have been impossible. This yeah. product is trying to help us do that. And like you mentioned a new product in the market. So how, how do you keep yourself updated on this one? That's a tricky one. So I would say me being in Google, it's easier for me because I get to understand the newer technology and how the market is shaping up. But mm-hmm. uh, for anybody outside, I would definitely say read any kind of a news which comes up. I would definitely also suggest uh, any kind of these conferences, even if we cannot attend it, always take a look at uh, some of the key videos or at least key takeaways from these uh, videos like Google Next, AWS security events, at least go through those and you will get to know how the trend is moving or how the market is moving. That way you can always keep up with this. Yeah, even I think you can get those conferences, you know, uh, tickets in a cheaper price if you book like maybe a few months ago, uh, early bird uh, and I think uh, even there will be discount. If you know any any person, maybe even they can provide you those tickets. Because coming to Sectar, there was a like one of my uh, friend who gave me a ticket. He was he was having a stall and he gave me a ticket. Uh, so I got an opportunity to go there. So it's all about networking. So try to meet people sure. and you, you can even get those uh, get to into those conferences and learn from them as well. And this is a perfect networking opportunity. Security is a smaller landscape compared to other technology. But you get to meet a lot of a lot of like-minded people, a lot of intelligent folks out there doing a lot of different things, and you get to share your ideas, and eventually you understand how vast and how people are thinking about some of those are some of those things which we feel like okay, maybe I could have thought or may not have even considered. Those are being considered new ideas, new technology. I would definitely suggest uh, any of these conferences, and and don't forget to participate. Like. You can always present. Sometimes, as I told you, right? Like we tend to get inhibited, saying that I may not be into that that state where I could present or I could talk about it. But remember, a lot of people are starting their journey, and they would always be benefited by what you have to share. Uh, that's how you you can grow in your life, right? In your career, sure. meeting new people, and also like you have to. I uh, I feel that you know sometimes you have to be in an uncomfortable position. For example, you know. Uh, giving us speeches because back then I was a part of uh, Google Developer Students Club where it, it, it's under Google. So I used to train people. So there was an initial time where uh, I was giving a speech to, you know, like more than 200 people. And I was, uh, initially I was afraid. I, I, I just thought, okay, let's let's do it. And that's how it's done. But yeah, it, it's a great experience. Like after that, uh, if there were like say thousand people, I can do that. Because it's I would say fun. that I would say that I I am still kind of frightened. I always get nervous, but I feel like it should not hinder me. I should move ahead and try it out. Yeah, it's, it's always difficult, right? Coming in front of a crowd, talking your idea. Sometimes you feel like you cannot completely vet your solutions. Sometimes you'll feel like, oh, what kind of questions will come up? All the people are better than me. There would be a lot of lot of these thoughts in mind. But yeah, go go ahead, give it a try. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, also like. Uh, Coming back to like uh, cloud, most applications are micro uh, services, right, which are deployed in Kubernetes. So do you think uh, it, should, it need to be secured differently? I would say that, uh, again, coming back to the same initial thought process, uh, security basics remain same. Uh, but having shared that, uh, you definitely would have to adopt a lot. Kubernetes is a very different infrastructure landscape compared to VM. And definitely, if, if you would have followed this Kubernetes journey, you would have seen a lot of newer technologies come up from Kubernetes world. 
So you will use whatever you have learned, but you will get a chance to even enhance it. And recently you would have seen a lot of concepts like uh, micro segmentation, zero trust, all of these will, you will see in action compared to other places. And mm -hmm. I would also say like it is more valuable in microservices because there would be a lot of intercommunication between different services. And that's where you'll see a lot of values An ideal world where you would easily segment your networks and you'll say that this is my prod, this is my non-prod, or this is my DMZ kind of solution. It's more about everything is individual and there is a complete zero trust. You start trusting each other, like you would have heard of mutual authentication between two pods, right? Which is not a case when you talk about VMs. A VM can talk to another VM just if there is a network access, not in case of Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. I'll say learning Kubernetes as an infrastructure will give you a more thorough understanding of the security. You get to think a little bit more, but from technology point of view, things still remain same. It is still the same authentication, but we are going to implement those here. You will still see network policies. You will see a little bit more about even about OS security. We will see how containers react with the kernels. How can we prevent those? What system calls are allowed or not? It is similar, but of course, uh, you'll get to learn more about a different security technology. So just for uh, our audience understanding, can you share a bit about like what is Kubernetes and what is uh, like microservices? Okay, just Kubernetes is an orchestration tool. It is a tool which eventually help you. Let's say you want to deploy any container, right? Container in a shorter term, I'll just say that it's a smaller process, which is self-contained in itself. And you deploy the, uh, that let's consider a front end you deploy it as a process which is a container and that is different compared to vm because you can deploy multiple of them into the same vm and then you can still maintain the segregation between them the capacity is reduced but without talking about all these now since we know that you can deploy these you want a mechanism where you should be able to deploy them consistently check the health of those Make sure that uh, if there is a, a lot of traffic load, it automatically scales. Maintain that uh, security between different or the communication and security between different ports. All of these can be done manually, but of course that will be too hectic. That's where a solution called orchestration came into the picture. That's where Kubernetes came into the picture. And right now I think uh, that is one of the most, or I'll say like a major orchestration too. True, true. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And also like uh, what advice do you give to small and medium sized companies for lack of the resources for these dedicated uh, cloud security teams? I would say that definitely now keep an engineering mindset. Initially, we used to consider security and engineering as a very different field. Now we need to bring engineering into security. That's where automation, about DevOps, platform engineering now. Eventually, we have to make system work for us. There is still number of resources in security. It cannot be managed. There is a lot of alerts despite different technology coming up. There is still alert fatigue. So we have to rely on automations. So I would simply say, let's bring that practice of development engineering into security. And if you can merge that, I think it would be much easier. The second piece of advice would be to try to do a security by design. Whenever you build something, try to build it in a secure way. Try to shift flip it to the developers. Keep them an understanding of what a normal secure application look like. And if you can do that, they would be able to build those. And if they build those, you don't have to think about it later. And usually, as I talked about alert fatigue and all, right, it would be too difficult for you to manage data rather than think about it during your development life cycle. So these are the two key areas. Yeah, I do agree because like uh, if you start building those applications securely, maybe it may take time to you know find those vulnerabilities because back then I made an Android app and uh, they, like uh, I did a certification like certified ethical hacker where I was trying to learn about how can we find the vulnerabilities in Android apps. So True. I did took the previous app and I just uploaded one of the random site and uh, honestly I was seeing all the code like what I have written all the code and I was also checking the APIs. I was able to find those APIs. So if anyone can find it they can usually you know uh, use those uh, sure. like my apis in their uh, systems so that's, that's where i think uh, ai would be a great help for a lot of people who initially were hesitant to start with coding right like they can simply ask and say hey explain me this particular code and they get an understanding hey summarize this for me and they have an a summarization also if they need to add something they can easily ask it but of course be careful with what what data you share 
but AI should be used. I would definitely say that rather than running away from it, use it and then it will make your journey much easier. Yeah, you can understand these concepts like much in easier terms, I guess. And uh, look ahead, like what do you see as most exciting or uh, transformative developments in security? Some of those, I would definitely say AI would be definitely one. I think for me, after internet, this should be a biggest technology advancement. It's not because AI wasn't prevalent earlier. It was prevalent earlier. But the way it has proliferated in last year, you know, normal use cases, now you can see it around, right? It yeah. was there since a long period of a time, but it wasn't, I would say there wasn't a lot of ROI out of these AI applications. There were a lot of costs involved, a lot of effort involved, and the yeah. accuracy was little. But I think yeah. in last few years, we have improved a lot. So that is one of the key areas. Synapse in security would be definitely a, a big player, which you will definitely hear a lot around. Quantum computing, despite it looks far away, that would be another interesting topic, especially from encryption point of view. These are a few of the things which you'll definitely see exciting coming up in the next so, few years. So what are the implications of uh, quantum computing on security? Quantum computing, if you, uh, if you want to define quantum computing, rather than conventional computing, it focuses on quantum mechanics. And what, what does it provide it, right? It provides it with a capability to solve complex mathematic problems. And now how does it relate to uh, security? So if you heard of encryption, encryption utilizes prime factorization. It is easy to multiply two prime numbers, but it is very difficult to get from one particular prime number, the two prime numbers which, which eventually multiplied and uh, got that value, right? Which is a prime factorization. And since that is a very difficult problem, people started using that to uh, create your encryption. But now, as I told you, quantum computer has that capability to solve complex mathematical problems, they can easily solve that problem. So what will happen? There is still limitations. I'll say like uh, it's a lot of costs involved for quantum computers. Hardware is still rare. And then uh, there is still a lot of quantum application need to do a little bit of error correction. So there is still some time ahead. But mm -hmm. despite saying that, the problem still remains. People can still harvest all of your cipher data, encrypted data. And later on, let's say when Len in five years time, let's assuming five years time, when the hardware is powerful, uh, the cost is cheaper, and you eventually manage to decrypt those. So, and I think uh, this is a very uh, good time to start implementing newer encryption mm -hmm. methodology. I think just a few days back, I think uh, NIST released three encryption technology algorithms, quantum proof encryption methodology, they call it. I would still say like they are still in an early stage, but mm -hmm. there is, I guess, MLKEM, which okay. is model lattice key encapsulation mechanism I assume. And then there is a, again, model lattice based uh, digital signature, signature algorithm. And there, there are a few others. And I think we should start using those, especially for our sensitive data. The problem again is like, uh, our current encryption method can be broken, not now, later. People can harvest it and maybe use it later for decrypting those. Yeah, true. I think uh, using these uh, quantum mechanics, maybe threat actors can use it to break into that. So maybe as true. you said, like, this has you know, provided these encryption levels. Probably I think in future uh, it will be implemented once uh, the process is uh, properly initiated, I guess. True. I, I, I'm hopeful yeah. that uh, these, yeah. advance, these advancements are definitely good, but yeah. And I, I'm happy that uh, NIST is thinking beforehand and they are already building these algorithms before. True, true. So how is uh, a, a Gen AI used in security? There are two aspects to it, right? Basically one, how do you secure Gen AI? And the other aspect is always, how do you use security in Gen AI in security? Let me talk about uh, first about how do you use security or Gen AI in security. For me, the biggest problem in security is SecOps. There is a lot of alerts, there is a lot of findings, vulnerabilities, threads. You talk about uh, different combinations of uh, these kind of findings, different observations, data sensitivity, risk identified, credential compromise, credential leakage, and people have a lot to work upon. And that's where I think uh, Gemini or your AI would help you out. First, you should be able to easily write your queries we have a lot of different tools to generate logs, right? Like we have antivirus, we have a lot of tools. And uh, we have a lot of vendors like Sim Solutions, which give you a mechanism to store it, but you still have to learn some language eventually query it. But think about it, like today I want to just understand 
hey where is my this particular asset has this been used by this particular ip address or is there an access to this particular asset by any ip address beyond my organization's ip address if yes what is that ip address you are just writing in a normal natural language and it is converting it into the rule which the yeah. law can interpret and give you a result and not only those right like you are just not thinking about searching you can do a, your threat hunting you can create a rules based on those and then eventually you could write uh, some automatic pro books you want to say like okay if these kind of threats come up maybe i want to send my files to virus total to get some information about what kind of file this is maybe i want to get more threat intelligence feed to get more information about it so all these enrichment but remember you do not have to learn any technology you are still just writing saying giving a prompt to ai and getting an information out of it to create a playbook so that journey would be very easy that is one aspect again the programming as i told you engineering has to be mixed with security and ai would definitely help you learn it very faster it used to take me a longer period of a time to learn a programming language and now i have something even if i don't know let's say javascript i can mm -hmm. simply learn it in fewer or a shorter period of a time uh -huh. compared to the earlier times so ai would definitely help you it will make your life much easier not only i talk just about security operations but it could be even secure design right we would like to understand what are the best practices to design this particular application what are the best practices which are already provided by the say cloud service provider to use this particular service and how do you design it in your context let's say you want to say i want to build an application which will host pii data and mm -hmm. i need to make it available to all my employees and they could access it from internet that is a very specific use case and if you would have to think a lot around it and what you can do just give it is a natural language prompt and you have all the information is handy yeah you don't have to think of anything about it of course you yeah, take it as a sort of person and eventually think about it saying not everything is 100% right there is hallucination there is no proper citation no grounding so you have to think through but it definitely give you a head start so that's how like you just need to give a plain text and it will give you the information where you can use it uh, to build that and also like for example you know even like securing this ai uh, the ai applications is important right for example if there is any threat attacker who let's say uh, get the information of that uh, gen ai applications most of the information he can he can steal it so how do you think sure. uh, uh, secure these gen ai applications okay so i think most of the people have already heard about like uh, prompt hacking right that is prompt injection is a common term and people are well aware about it uh, and i would try to simplify this this problem and give you some context how can you solve it right or you could have already seen a lot of open source software like llm guard nemo guard rails river already doing some of these and also a lot of vendors like palo alto even google has their own solutions for these but in general it is still i want to simplify it and say that security still remains simple and uh, what are you going to check let's say you are inputting something you want to check against certain set of uh, bad words let's say we always say that forget about earlier instructions and then act like this so there are common patterns if you say so those could be basic word or word list right that you could start with or people always try to understand is beside or how to interact with oas and they could try to send system prompts for those so you could always create a word list that is a very basic starting point right mm -hmm. and maybe you can go further you can build a regex and say that okay if these regex can identify it perfect if not let's go further we can say that okay let's build a database let's build a database and uh, that database we can easily feed our input into that database and see if it matches then flag it let's go further we can say let's use llm that way we will see the similarity not exact match but the similarity mm -hmm. that way you can say that okay maybe it is not directly similar but it looks similar and then based upon that since now llm gives you a capability of those similarities right and that way you can say that these attacks look similar to already identified attack and mm -hmm. you can leverage those and then you would have heard of how do you store it i don't want to go too much into technology but you use a database which supports to input these as a as a embedding embedding is a concept i'm keeping it aside but just i'm saying there is a database which you can run not only direct search but a similarity search let's mm -hmm. go further you want to go further right like let's go further and say you want to protect ai applications maybe whatever output comes through that maybe we can use again another llm 
to say which have been already been trained to identify those kind of prompts which is adversarial prompts from non adversarial or right prompts and you mm -hmm. can always ask those llms to do that for you so if you see this journey like small not all of these fits to everyone's uh, life cycle mm -hmm. some of these would be too costly to implement you may not realize too much of an roi so for security you should always look into like what risk you manage to mitigate using what controls if the risk is high you definitely want to solve it but if the risk is low and if you are implementing a control which is too difficult to implement or maintain it does not make sense so despite i told you all few mechanisms right i can go further like you have a prompt you will want to see you want to see do the dlp right you want to identify if there is pi data or not so that it is not revealed or maybe you want to see if that output gives you a url you want to check against uh, any particular thread feed and see whether that url is malicious or not all of these can be built as a solution individually as a module or there are tools which have done it but again the pension to use this will depend upon the roi the complexity and the risk it reduces and you mentioned like tools right so can you please share is there any available tools uh, that can help for securing these applications yeah for yeah. open source i would say you can use revolve uh, nemo guardrails llm guard and if you want to look into the proprietary there are from gcp there is from palo alto so you can always leverage those yeah. and this is not this is just one kind of a thread and you will also have to think like there is similar thread which you have already seen like data security right it doesn't go away so that data yeah. security risk still remains we talk about supply chain like your model can be compromised let's assume somebody compromises your module you build a module you train a data that could be a compromised data set now your model is compromised if your model is compromised anybody using that application is compromised so there is a supply chain attack too so you have to look it from different angles and come up with a solution so the technology in short all i wanted to say was the technology still remains same it gets a better flavor or different different kind of flavor which eventually gives you more capability but it is still remains same whether it is on prem whether it is cloud whether it is kubernetes or it is ai yeah uh, even uh, previously like uh, i had uh, seen a news where uh, people are uh, you know using prompts where they are trying to get the code like malicious code through which they can you know uh, hack certain systems but i think right now due to certain policies it has been implemented by those uh, llms so sure. yeah and also and it like, goes beyond like yeah. it really goes beyond like uh, we are only talking about few of those aspects of ai i'm not even talking about ethical aspects like mm -hmm. let's consider that uh, how can you make sure that your data the example is you you want to say let's recite a william shakespeare's poem what will happen so if consider llm for me uh, in a simple term i always say llm is a fill in the blanks the reason i say fill in the blanks is it is learning into a lot of data it looks into the data and gives you a value based on the probability of how much it is repeated right so based on that it will give you an output so if you train a smaller data saying that william shakespeare told about some latest song about somebody then it will respond back that rather than the real answer so that's where you would look into citation you would want to look into grounding by grounding i mean to say you want to make sure like let's say we are building an ai solution which helps you search uh, into your organization's internal documents about leap policies mm -hmm. so the answer should always come from the leap policy document it should not hallucinate it should not go beyond that and that's what will make that ai search useful that is what grounding is so that mm -hmm. is your citation grounding we didn't even talk about bias how does mm -hmm. it can bring in biases so there are multiple factors which still need to be factored in uh, when building an ai application there is ethical aspect there is a responsible ai there is input prompt injections there is supply chain attacks there is all your pipelines data security all of these still becomes relevant and also like uh, there is a white house executive order on ai right and you act which was recently passed so will that affect the organizations i would say this is a good step i would definitely say that there should be some control there should be some right now technology is advancing we are trying to build a lot of things out of it mm -hmm. it is being used everywhere a lot of data is being used people are unaware what kind of data to put what not to put so there needs to be some check and balance and that's where these regulations and act would definitely be helpful uh, but also i am hopeful that they should not hinder too much and that advancement should happen and it is bound to happen and we should support it in a ethical way yep. 
we are we are you know advancing in this ai and stuff but still there are a lot of vulnerabilities right there are a lot of cyber attacks like recently sure. there was uh, due to a small update there was a outage like microsoft outage and there was the chrome vulnerability so what's your opinion on this one if you if you look into that uh, attack, uh, attack or i will say like out it outages right so we talked too much about threats vulnerabilities and we saw that a very small it update kind of took down the world and a lot of financial implications around it and if you see the mistake right uh, again uh, all of these are all my own opinions not yeah. employers or anyone's but uh, if you look into these all you see is a very simple mistake for me it is i'll say out of bound memory mm-hmm. it was that simple it was trying to look for a input in a memory which was not there right it was trying to find a value which was out of the memory so you dedicate certain amount saying this is what i want my area or structure to be in and now mm-hmm. you are trying to search outside or beyond that and since it doesn't find it it keeps on trying it it crashes and eventually you have seen what is the implication and now you'll talk about why windows why linux so i think by now everybody is aware that you can use uh, a lot of these vendors can directly integrate with uh, kernel level in windows however in linux there is an ebf uh, ebpf kind of a solution which is let's consider that there is still problem but it will result into kernel panic attack something like that but it will not completely disrupt mm-hmm. your os so the intention was right they wanted to build something improve a product they want to improve the monitoring what's happening on an endpoint and uh, if you saw it was a very simple mistake of uh, somebody saying that this is my input i want to expect 20 inputs but you are searching for 21 hour inputs and then suddenly it crashes a basic common mistake all in all all i can say is taking a process if people would have put a lot of time or effort in in the process on uh-huh. testing this may could have been averted sometime we think too much about a larger piece and we forget about a process security is all about process and if you miss anything out there is going to be an issue and it it would have a huge impact so so that's the reason i was talking about critical analytical ability which google seeks right is understanding that impact understanding that how your update will interact with your kernel and could take your machine down and what kind of impact it can have it is not a simple error saying you are you are searching for 21 input and uh you have only defined 20 inputs so it is a simple mistake which could have been averted if a better testing approach better process oriented results uh thank you saying that and even uh, recently we said no to 23 billion dollar offer by google right so what is this technology which organizations think will be prominent for the future and willing to pay such amounts i think that should be an exciting news uh, the reason is uh, look at the technology right people are buoyant about this technology which is again the synapse solution uh-huh. which we talked about earlier the synapse does give you a capability where earlier you had a lot of analytics you got more context or risk based approach easier to merge all of these into a single solution but again nobody knows uh, where the technology goes we'll have to see and the time will tell how the technology evolves but at the time when ai is making all the buzz it is good to see that security is also making some buzz yeah i think right now the security is booming a lot because there are a lot of vulnerabilities part of uh, systems have been you know hacked and like trying to be hacked in even the like morning i've found a news that where you know in olympics there was like 43 uh, attacks i guess from the attackers but i think they have stopped it but everywhere people are trying to hack it where you know you need to uh, build your system securely uh, do the patches accordingly and also sure. like you have to know the vulnerabilities right before building a secure application what 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 are the some of the uh, websites that you suggest for people who want to know about vulnerabilities if you just want to learn about a vulnerability oab should be a good one to start with but if you want to know about what's happening recently mm-hmm. there is a lot of threat intelligence feed even google produces i guess there is a threat analyst group which mm-hmm. produces a lot of information about what kind of attack is happening and you get to read about those you understand implications of some of these things we talked about like uh, you talked about patching right sometime uh, if you see when somebody discloses a vulnerability and the time to patch that vulnerability like a crowd strike everybody knew how to patch it but it still took time and one day of an outage for a whole airline could be like a billion dollar of loss so a simple idea of patching being able to patch these things can matter a lot 
but how do you understand these right like how you could have factored these in if you would have read those report and see that okay this happened into that particular context or that particular thread and now i understand that there should be a mechanism to patch as fast as a vulnerability is disclosed if it is disclosed today i should be in a place to patch all my critical machines within less than one hour or you have your own sla but yep. you should be able to do during those time frame so i think those one uh, thread groups should be definitely good one if you just want to look into uh, vulnerability i think uh, of course you can go into the nvd database and then all language packs and everybody who have a vulnerability explains about it some of those would definitely help you out but i think sometime it is overload too you have to be cautious and then yeah, take, even like take, you, take it with your own on style yeah like you mentioned like uh, we can patch if you know the vulnerability right if you know the discourse like what about like zero sure. day vulnerabilities uh, i would say that people people are quite fixated on zero day i i would still say that, like the simpler thing what you can do is always focus on your your secure foundation your secure by design practice uh-huh. zero day vulnerabilities are rare uh-huh. it doesn't happen often and you should always be in a position to prepare to be able to respond to this you cannot you will not know any zero days which is exploited in a wild but you can build a capability to respond to it so you know what are your critical asset where are they uh, situated you have a proper discovery you know if you go into an enterprise right you will see like uh, it is not only technology technology could be one simple problem to solve but that process around it is a very bigger problem to solve a lot of enterprise doesn't even know what are their assets where are they lying who is the owner of that asset and whenever there is a vulnerability or an attack or an incident nobody knows who to reach out so, so that's where for zero day vulnerability you should be prepared you should be in a position saying that okay if i know this is a vulnerability and if i get an information i should be able to block it understand its activities within the environment thwart its uh, lateral movement capabilities and able to read more about or understand more of its behavior so that we could come up with some signature or patterns to protect it for people who want to get into cloud security if someone asks okay, what is cloud security what should like the answer cloud security now cloud security is imminent it is everywhere or you will be using throughout things doesn't change it is just a securing of your application in cloud i would say it makes your life easier the reason is there is a shared responsibility model some of these would be taken by the cloud service provider so you mm-hmm. have lesser thing to focus on and since with automations and engineering practices a lot of things which you are setting to the left a lot of people are aware i would definitely say that there is a lot of awareness so these things makes you it gives you a lot of capabilities in your hand it makes your life easier. of course you have to be more putting those controls as early as possible so for me cloud security is just an extension it is the same security just implemented at a cloud level uh, thank you saying that also like uh... coming to like you know casual question like what about joy what excites you about your work i think for me know? it is as simple as like uh, the transformation journey you see right like as i talked about uh, it's not always about technology sometimes you see the transformation journey where customers or people understand how fragile their environment is what are the things they need to resolve whether it's mm-hmm. a technology whether they need to bring a devops practice whether they need to bring sri practice into their environment or if they need to improve on their appsec process or or just about simple things like identifying the owner of an asset and when you manage to help people understand all these make those changes and transform them into a state where a lot of those are automatic they are more prepared for these it gives that excitement saying that okay people are doing great and i think even uh, google has a environment right to like uh, a comfortable environment where people can go and work and there is also a gaming section a lot of different sections where you know and i can uh, i think we should make another podcast inside. just talking about the perks with google <laughs> yeah true uh, back then when i went to google office even like uh, i like i went to one of my friend and we also went to kitchen and we sure. made a maggie and we ate it's there. a fun environment <laughs> you will definitely find it so, more respectable and fun environment out of the most industries right so we are in the end of the podcast so is there anything that uh, you want to share with our listeners any final thoughts or any inspirational words that you want to give uh, i think i'll audience? say don't limit your capabilities don't think that you cannot do anything i think this is a world or era where we have all the capabilities we have youtube to learn a lot of things we have a lot of podcast to understand different perspective we have labs available so go ahead get your hands dirty learn a lot try things out don't hesitate to speak reach out to anyone 
this is the era where you can do anything at all. And now with AI, don't think that it is difficult or hard or difficult to adopt. It is just an API call to end model and get an information out. So once you try using it, you'll find it easy. So all I say, go, go ahead, try to develop something, get your hands dirty, grind, 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 and you'll eventually go. Thanks for sharing that, Mikesh. So this is the end of the podcast. And uh, if you've not subscribed to my channel, please do subscribe to my channel. I'm pretty sure. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks, everyone.